Hertz has got it, wants to throw. Hertz setting up the screen. It is complete and blown up. Miles Sanders caught it. Malcolm Rodriguez was there waiting for him. That's a big play by Rodrigo. Welcome to week three of the 20 Men in the Huddle podcast presented by Microsoft. Detroit Lions coming off a huge 36-27 win over the Washington Commanders and now hit the road for the first time. Hostile environment. Um, going into Minnesota, obviously a big game um, because it's the first road test, because it's a division game. And look, the Lions are tied atop the NFC North. All four teams in the division are 1-1. One and one. So look, it's a huge week three game to, to, to get to 2-1, and one, stay in first place, and I think make a statement. Um, um, you know, to, to the rest of the NFL that that these first two weeks kind of, you know, were what the Detroit Lions are, which is a gritty football team, a tough football team, a team that's going to play with you every week. And look, when we get ready for, for Sunday, I think we got to start with the news and notes. And I, I think you got to start on the injury front. Um, let's start with the good news. Good news is Frank Ragnow center was back at practice, um, you know, this week, which, which I think is a terrific sign that he's trending toward playing again. Now, Evan Brown did a terrific job last week in his place. And I think he's one of the best backups in the league, but look, Frank Ragnow is, you know, a pro He's one of the best centers in the league. So obviously that would be a big boost, excuse me, for this Detroit Lions offense to get to get, you know, one of the best centers back in the league. Amani Oriwarie, who missed last week with a back injury that flared up in practice last week. He was back on the practice field. So, uh, you know, obviously a good sign that, that he's trending in the right direction. Obviously, when we talk about Minnesota and Justin Jefferson and all those weapons that they have on the outside. If you can get Amani back with Jeff on the other side, who's playing really, really well, you know, obviously that's huge for Detroit. The not so good Jonah Jackson dealing with that finger injury, um, you know, still not back at practice. Probably not a good sign that he's you know pl- trending toward playing Sunday. But we'll obviously have to wait and see how the end of the week goes. Those game designations on Friday are obviously going to be huge with him. No Aiden Hutchinson at practice on Wednesday. No DeAndre Swift. But um, I'm pretty optimistic about both guys. Aiden Hutchinson's dealing with uh, uh, Charlie Horse in the thigh. I think that was just kind of rest, maintenance, um, get that thing rested up. He should be ready to go. At least that's my anticipation. And then DeAndre Swift, I think that was just a rest day to begin the week. Uh, Dan Campbell said that he the ankle feels better than it did at this point last week, and he obviously played through that. You could tell he was dealing with it in the game, but still explosive, had the great touchdown catch and, and everything else I would expect him to to play, play. So that's kind of where we stand on the injury front front. You know, I think it's a, it's a huge game. I, I, this is kind of a measuring stick game to me, uh, you know, going on the road to a Minnesota team that, that look, they lost by three possessions to Philadelphia. This Detroit Lions team lost by three points. So, you know, which team shows up now, obviously that was on the road um, for Minnesota. Detroit had Philly at home. So, you know, you've got to take that into consideration too, but um, you know, now you've got, uh, you know, two teams that lost Two very different ways to a same opponent. An opponent who I think is, is you know, one of the better teams in the NFC is going to be right there at the end of the year in, in, in the NFC playoff picture. So how does Detroit handle the road? U.S. Bank Stadium is one of my favorite places to go just because of the atmosphere and how loud that place gets. It's a tough place to play. And so now Jared Goff and this offense that's been so great, scored the most offensive points in the league um, through the first two weeks. Now, you know, they've got to go to some of their silent count stuff. Now they've got to deal with, you know, crowd and, 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 kind of an adverse environment. How do they handle that? Can they continue to run the football? Um, you know, 191 yards, 181 yards. That's really been the story for me offensively the first two weeks. They've controlled um, the game with their run game. That's allowed Jared now to, to use play action. That's where he's comfortable. Jared Goff, six touchdowns, one reception. But really, I think that all that is based off that run game and, and getting that going now two weeks in a row. Can that continue um, for three weeks? You know, I want to go back a little bit on the injury front because there is you know one bigger injury John Kaminsky um, hurt his thumb kind of played through it in the fourth quarter but had surgery um, this week they listed as a wrist it's it's kind of right around that thumb wrist area right there um, he's going to be down for you know 
probably a couple weeks we'll see exactly how long, but he's not certainly not going to play Sunday. Look, that's a huge loss for Detroit. You know, he doesn't show up, I think, in in the stat book as much. But look, he was leading this team with eight quarterback pressures. He, his rush is what set up one of Aiden Hutchinson's sacks last week. He can set the edge. He gives you a kind of that pass rush from the interior, and you know that NASCAR package when when him and Aiden come in and can rush from the interior, and, and they can bring some of their you know different edge guys. That's really been a great package for them. And so, you know, I think that that's a big loss for Detroit. And and look, someone's going to have to now step up. Um, they're going to still want to put Aiden inside. Who do they pair him with? Who steps up? Uh, do, will Demetrius Taylor get his first start this week? Will, will Austin Bryant be back in the lineup after being a healthy scratch this week? Who can step up and kind of fill that role until John can get back? It's a bigger loss than I think people think. Um, you know, I'm on Ross St. Brown to me is obviously a huge storyline. You look at all the, the press releases, the league, you know, releases and, and, you know, he's right in every single one of those previewing, you know, this weekend's matchups obviously has eight catches in eight straight games going for the NFL record. And the one thing we talked with Amon Ra this week and we talked with Jared Goff and, and they both said it, it doesn't seem forced. You know, that's a lot of catches. He had nine catches, 116 yards, a touchdown last week, had two rushes, 68 yards. You know, I think he was targeted 12 times, but even watching the game, I didn't feel like it was, you know, let's force the ball to Amon Ra. Let's get this record. And Amon Ra didn't feel that way anyway. It's just kind of, he, he's so good uh, in terms of gaining separation at the top of his route, at understanding coverages, always picking the right way to go on those choice routes. And look, him and Jared Goff have a really good rapport. And I think Jared Goff trusts that young guy, you know, maybe more than any receiver he's got right now. And so, you know, I think it's just kind of a, a, a natural thing. They see that at, as a great matchup for Detroit every week. I think they go in wanting to attack it. It's not something where they're force feeding. It's just happening through the, you know, the flow and the course of the game. And, and you know, can they make it, um, you know, nine straight games with eight catches? And that's just still amazing to me. I mean, we have to remember this. This kid is, what, two games into his second season? Um, obviously, we all know the 17th receiver taken and, and all that kind of stuff and, and how that's motivated him. But, boy, I think Brad Holmes and Lions really stumbled onto something special here. To me, when I look at him and I watch him on film, the Detroit Lions have their version of Heinz, Heinz Ward with with. I'm on Ross St. Brown. I think we can say that in his second year, just how much better is he going to continue to get with his ability to block, the toughness, the route running, the good hands. Even though he's had a couple drops, I think he's got to clear that up. He'll be the first one to say that. But, you know, can he continue on this streak and, and, and get to, uh, um, get to nine, nine straight games with eight catches? And then I talked about a little bit, to me, one of the big keys here, you're going on the road, I think, one, you have to protect your golf. Um, and I think you do that by establishing the run and keeping going with that. We talked about 191 yards, 181 yards. You cannot go into that kind of environment and, and you know, not be successful running the ball. Now all of a sudden, Zadarius Smith and Daniel Hunter can pin their ears back, can tee off a little bit, um, and, and that, that noise can really become a factor. I think a successful recipe for Detroit, to me, is you go in there and continue to do what you do. You know, you, you play a power run game. You, you quiet that crowd. You, know, you take them out of it. You, you don't get behind on the, on the scoreboard. You protect your defense. That's obviously a, a pretty good offense there with a lot of weapons. To me, the key is really can they continue to get Swift going? Can they continue to get Jamal Williams going? And now you can do the play action and get Amon Ra and DJ and, and, and TJ Hawkinson, and all those guys involved in the pass game. To me, you've got to continue to rush the ball because that'll protect Jared Goff and, and keep those really talented edge rushers off of him. That to me is is really one of the biggest keys to this game. But we're going to talk about keys with Mark Craig of the Minneapolis Star Tribune. He does a great job breaking down this matchup. So we'll have that for you next. Joining me now on the 20 Minute in the Huddle podcast is Mark Craig of the Minneapolis Star Tribune. Mark, thanks for joining me, my friend. How are you doing over there? Doing well. How are you doing, Tim? I'm doing all right. Now, we obviously are doing a little bit better than you this week. We're coming off, obviously, a big win you know, versus the Washington Commanders. You guys, a little bit different story. Tough loss on Monday night. But look, hey, we know how that goes with the Philadelphia Eagles here. We lost week one. Just give me your, your, your quick analysis of, of that game Monday. And, and you know, what did the Eagles do so well defensively to, to limit you, know, you guys and that explosive offense you have? You know, I... 
I, I obviously I, I picked uh, Philadelphia to win prime time Monday night um, in Philadelphia. It was a tough, but the, the, what was alarming to me was the utter inability to compete with them in the first half. The, uh, the Vikings defense, you know, had no answers. That that soft shell defense with uh, zone coverage was a disaster, and there was no they they made no changes. Uh, what they what they did offensive or defensively was they shut Dalvin Cook down. After you know they they assumed that they could run the ball because you know they were, uh, you know the Lions were able to run the ball on on Philadelphia well you know the Vikings tested it two times two three times with Dalvin Cook in the first half Dalvin had three carries for three yards you know I, I've been saying this you know I guess as the old guy in town you know uh, you know they're still the running the ball is still important as Detroit's finding out I mean that offense right now is. Is, is looks really good because they're physical and they and they're running the ball. I mean, I just got done watching the first half of Washington and man, some of those runs in the second quarter just pounding around the middle. Um, that's where they got off base, and then they only had the ball for ten minutes and twenty one plays. So once they shut, they clamped the run down early. The Vikings away from it, and then they didn't have enough plays to to get going. So uh, just a total, uh, you know, the, the Lions competed with them, you know, I, I, but the Vikings just didn't compete. You know, I think probably part of that, too, is, you know, you guys got down, you know, quick. Um, you know, you had a bunch of three and outs. I think four of your first five, um, you know, possessions were three and outs. And then you get behind on the scoreboard. That takes Delvin Cook out. But, but ten touches for Delvin Cook, including the four catch, that, that's just not enough, in, in my opinion. Part of that was probably being behind. But how much do they have to rectify that this week and get Delvin involved early and keep him involved if they want success at home against Detroit? Well, I think it's the key. I mean, you know, the gritty and Jefferson is the is the hot thing, but to me, it doesn't work without Dalvin. Um, you know, you can if you take Dalvin out of the game, everything kind of collapses because Kirk is not the kind of quarterback that's going to throw a team on his back. Kirk is a Kirk's a fascinating guy to cover because Kirk sort of like is the 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 country right now. Fifty percent hate him, fifty percent love him, and nobody, everyone's dug in. And there is no, you know, uh, if you write something good about Kirk, you got 50% coming after you. If you write something bad about Kirk, the other 50% is coming after you. Kirk is a very good quarterback, but Kirk is not a throw, you know, if your left tackle's out and your center's out, like, you know, Aaron Rodgers uh, throws a team on his back and can make everything work. Um, he needs a running game. He needs Dalvin to be in rhythm. And then everything kind of flows off of that. You know, Dalvin wasn't the star in week one, but, on first down, even when they were, it was still a game uh, with the Packers, they were balanced and Dalvin was getting his touches. And uh, then that just opened up uh, Jefferson, who was just wide open on so many occasions. Um, so yeah, Dalvin, it's, it's, it's critical, I think, for Dalvin to be involved and Dalvin to, to be in rhythm for everything else to keep cl- to click. You know, I think Kirk Cousins and, and Jared Goff are pretty similar in that way. You know, they're they're kind of system guys. You want to run, you do play action off that, um, keep on schedule. They're not guys that create a lot of plays, you know, outside of, of, of design. Um, so how important, obviously, this week, Aiden Hutchinson coming off three sacks, Charles Harris with, with a huge sack. You guys have a, a terrific, you know, pass rushing tandem over there. Detroit's trying to build one here, too. Just how important is protecting Kirk, keeping him on schedule for that offense to kind of you know stay in rhythm and keep going as well yeah and it's not only uh you know it's not only Aiden Hutchinson but it's a Kirk you know when there's pressure up the middle and the Vikings weakness on the offensive line right now is at center and they got a rookie right guard so um you know they stay in the past not this year but they've struggled with like a Kenny Clark or or Akeem Hicks those huge you know monster uh, defensive tackles that can put pressure up the middle because the center is not as big or as stout as he should be. Um, but yeah, like Aiden, I just uh, watched the first half and Hutchinson is looks, you know, a guy like that, you just knew was going to, you know, it, obviously he's only two games in, but that, that transfers to the NFL, you know, immediately, I think, you know, uh, one of those top pass rushers like that, as long as they stay healthy. Yeah. And he's, he's a guy that's not also not going to stop. Was, uh, at least one of his sacks was, you know, he just kept going and he kind of ran into the quarterback. So, uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's a guy that, uh, that could wreck the game. You know, and a lot of times when I pick games, it's, it's based on where it's at. You know, uh, the Vikings had no pass rush last week. 
uh, in part because they don't, you know, U.S. Bank Stadium really helps this team, and it has, you know, going back to the Metrodome, and uh, when the crowd gets going and they they got their pass rushers going, I would say typically find a way to always have some good pass rushers. It, it's a totally different game than when they go on the road. So, yeah, I, I think it'll be um, if the Lions, you know, are are whenever the Vikings and Lions meet next. Uh, if the Vikings, if their Lions are successful, and that'll be a big deal in, in Detroit, a bigger deal in Detroit. I don't think it'll be a big, as big a deal here, but they still got to block the guy. You know, we're so used to to Mike Zimmer, obviously, and and the kind of that 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 you know double A gap blitz scheme. And I'm just curious, how are things different under Kevin O'Connell, obviously the head coach, and then Ed Dantel defensively? I, I, what can Lions fans expect from that defense? Is it is it a huge scheme shift? Do they do a lot of similar things? Just how is that defense different? What can Detroit expect from Minnesota Sunday? Uh, I think the defense is completely different. It's um... You know, as, as you as you know, um, being through a lot of coaches, you know, coaching changes, um, teams typically go from you know, um, completely different. When you fire, you fire one guy, the, the next guy that comes in is completely different, and that's the case here. You know, Zimmer was a crusty old defensive guy. You know, that was kind of barked at his players, kind of a throwback, uh, um, more of a gritty defense. Uh, and now Kevin O'Connell is completely opposite. It's opposite of Detroit too. So you have two kind of like two different cultures right now. You got one, the hard knocks, you know, old guy, uh, older guy, old school guy. You know, we're going to toughen up this team. And, and the other guy is more of the, you know, we're resting players. We're not going to play in the preseason. We're not going to hit. We're going to, you know, a lot of, they talk about a lot of uh, work above the shoulders. Uh, so, you know, the, the Lions right now look like a really tough physical team and the Vikings, um, yeah, you know, I'm not saying that the Vikings don't look tough, but I'm saying that that they're in, in week one. Everything that they told us about, you know, kind of like easing into this season came off perfect because they, they they dominated the Packers. It went on the road. It was a different story. So now this, we're going to find out a lot about this team because they're coming home after getting completely whipped uh, and facing a team that's a tough, you know, punch in the nose type of team. Can can they handle that? But defensively, it's a three four. Compared to Zimmer's, you know, four three, uh, very much almost all zone, sitting back, eyes on the quarterback. You know that stuff works when you're front four, like in Chicago when Donatell and Fangio were there, and you know they basically won uh, Coach of the Year for Matt Nagy because that defense was so dominant and 36 turn takeaways. Uh, you can do that when that front four is wreaking havoc, but when they're not getting there. It's there's so many holes that the quarterback probably doesn't know where to look first. Because if you looked at Jalen Hurts, that was a career game for him, just because everything was open, including his ability to run and the running back's ability to run. Mark, I got a couple before, a couple more for you. And again, I'm talking to Mark Craig, the uh, Minnesota Vikings beat writer for the Minneapolis Star Tribune. I'm just curious, what are Vikings players and coaches talking about w- with this Detroit team? You know, you mentioned it, the hard knocks and, and kind of that grit that they want, that that tough mentality, be a tough physical football team. We're, we're talking with coaches, we're talking with players this week. I'm, I'm just curious, what, what do they expect from this game on Sunday? Exactly what you're saying is that, you know, they're, they, there's, you know, and sometimes you take it with a grain of salt, but I think in this case, you know, because you never hear a, at least it's been a lot, many, many years before you went into a locker room and someone put any bulletin board. These guys are so polished about not saying anything to tick anyone off. But I think it's just sincere in that they've, you know, there's a respect for what they're, what's being built. Um, a lot of that respect might go back to, you know, that, um, that game in Detroit last year helped get Mike Zimmer fired. Um, you know, and I, I could, I saw that one cut I me. Mean, I was, I picked the, the Lions to win it because, and I said, this just feels r- wrong right now. This is a bad <laughs> matchup because the Lions, I think there was a lot, you know, a lot of close games. And I said, this team is not ready for to go on the road and, and deal with this team. Um, and they almost lost, you know, they almost lost at U.S. Bank Stadium when the Lions come out of nowhere, you know, and Cousins had to lead them down and score. But a lot of that is the grittiness. A lot of talk about Ben Johnson and what's going on with the offense. Um, you know, it, it'll be, it, to me, it'll be, it's going to be interesting to watch because they, they can do so many things and they can do more things now uh, than, than a typical Lions team. But can Jared Goff handle the, the noise and chaos and, and probably some pressure uh, on the road? Uh, you know, yeah, we'll see about that. So.
And that'll be key because Detroit's obviously first two games were at Ford Field, friendly environment. Now you've got to go to the silent counts. Things change a little bit. That atmosphere in Minnesota is one of the best in the league. It's one of my favorite places to go. I'm just curious, Mark, Craig, when you look at this matchup, what are your, you know, what's maybe one or two of your key matchups in this game? The Vikings come away with a win if what happens? If they rush the passer like they did against Aaron Rodgers in week one, that to me is the number one key. I think uh, obviously um, they start off on defense. Um, you know, if you win the toss, you defer. You put the Lions out there, even though that 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 defense, or that offense is, you know, scoring a, you know more points in the, in my lifetime of watching Detroit Lions. Um, but if you can get on top of them with that pass rush and set the tone that way, and then that kind of gives you some room to breathe with getting Dalvin involved. But so I'd say two things: one you know, getting after golf with the pass rush about him running like you did Jalen Hurts, go after him. And then you're not starting in the hole offensively and you get Dalvin going and then that just opens up and then they're grittying all over the place. But if they can't do that, then it's going to be, you know, there's going to be a lot of people. Uh, we're way too early to be saying fire O'Connell or anything like that. Uh, but it's going to be like, whoa, you know, something's not right here. This is going to take a little bit longer than we thought. Well, Mark, it should be a, a, a great matchup. I'm really interested to see how Detroit handles the road. Interested to see if there's kind of an identity that forms with, with Minnesota after two you know, very different kind of performances. Thanks for joining me. You're one of the best. I really appreciate your great stuff today, and I'll make sure I stop by in the press box and say hello. Thanks, Mark. Yeah, please do. Thanks, Tim. Every week I've got key matchups for you. They are presented by BetMGM. And, and here are the five for me this week. I'm going to start with up front. Taylor Decker, Detroit Lions left tackle versus Danielle Hunter, who I think is one of the better um, edge rushers in the league. Explosive guy. And these two, obviously, when you play a division opponent, they know each other very well. Um, so to me, that's always a, a key matchup with tackles and edge guys in division matchups. You face them so often. There's nothing, you know, Taylor Decker's going to do that, that Dan Daniel Daniel hasn't um, seen, and there's nothing Daniel's going to do that, that that Taylor hasn't seen. But look, when you look at Hunter, 10 career games versus the Lions, in those 10 games, 12 sacks, two fumble recoveries, took one of those fumbles back for a touchdown. Um, you know, he's been really good in those matchups. And, and, it, and it's such a good matchup to me because you look at the way Taylor Decker has played the first two weeks of the, uh, of, of the season. Two hurries. No sacks in two games. He's been really good. You know, and Penny Sewell on, on the other side, he's going to face the Darius Smith. And, and I kind of battled between myself which one was the bigger matchup. But to me, yeah, Daniel Hunter's the, the more explosive player. And, and Taylor's just been playing so well both in, in pass protection and in the run game that that to me is, is a huge matchup on the road, hostile environment. You can't let those two edge guys kind of get going. I think that's a matchup that's terrific for Detroit with Taylor Decker and Penny Sewell playing as well as they they have they've got to continue that you know the second one for me is you know when you talk about the Minnesota Vikings right you have to talk about Justin Jefferson their terrific wide receiver um and and you know how much will be he be with Jeff Okuda how much will be he be with Imani Oriarwe who we expect you know to play Sunday after returning to practice after missing last week with a back injury but when I look at this one and when I look at, at, at Jeff Okuda particularly when he's matched up and, and, and the Lions you know just play sides I, I don't expect them to you know travel Okuda or Imani with Jefferson I think they really like the way both those guys are playing and, and they like keeping them to a side so I, they're both going to see probably Justin Jefferson but when Jeff Okuda sees him in particular I, th I thought he's had a terrific start to his season he's allowed 63 passing yards in his coverage in two games, 31 and a half per game. I'll take that. He's got 15 tackles. He ain't afraid to mix it up in the in the run game. He's been very physical there, and he's got his hand on a ball with a pass defense. Um, it, it, Jefferson is a little bit scary to me this week because he was held in check last week. And, and when you talk about great players, when you talk about all pro players, I think it's really hard to hold those guys down two weeks in a row. I almost would have rather 
you know, he gone for 200 yards and, and a touchdown last week instead of, you know, I, th- I think he had, you know, 60 some yards. It was quite a bit under 100, no touchdowns, uh, two interceptions when, when throwing his way for Kirk Cousins. Um, so, you know, he's going to want to obviously get things rolling again at home. Um, you know, Detroit's job, number one, obviously, is to stop the run, you know, put um, Kirk Cousins in situations where he's got to throw, where now Aiden Hutchinson and those guys can get after him and, and, and maybe make a mistake for Jeff Okuda and Amani Oriwarie to take advantage of. But Jeff Okuda and, and Justin Jefferson, to me, is, is a big matchup because, you know, obviously Jefferson's looking to get right and, and, and Jeff is looking to continue a, a third straight game playing pretty well. All right, the third key matchup for me, DeAndre Swift, Lions running back, has been so good the first two weeks of the season. 20 carries, 200 yards. He's also caught five balls for 62 yards, and obviously that 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 crazy touchdown where he went from the seat of his pants to the end zone last week um, against Eric Kendricks, who I think is one of the better linebackers in this league. And and, and to me, it's simple. Look, Detroit's rushed for 191 yards, 181 yards in, in their two games, and the recipe for success for them offensively is to keep that going. And I, it, it's going to be Eric Kendrick's job and the rest of that Minnesota defense which is a very different looking defense you know we're so used to you know the Mike Zimmer the the you know double a gap blitz look now this is a three four um there in Minnesota now so it it, it, it's a different look under their new defensive coordinator and the new head coach um so it's going to be a little unfamiliar to Lions fans probably watching this um but Eric Kendricks is still one of the better ones in the business. Look, he's averaging eight tackles per game against the Lions over his last ten uh, over his last ten games with three sacks, two interceptions. So he's a difference maker for them, and it's going to be you know I think a lot on him when DeAndre Swift tries to get into space, tries to become a bigger part of the passing game, which Ben Johnson has said he wants Swift to be. It's going to be you know Kendricks that that's going to be the one there you know tasked with with, with trying to stop DeAndre. So to me, can the Lions kind of match that up? And and get those two, you know, in space together and, and can Swift make Kendricks miss and, 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 you know, have some of those big plays and can they continue to run on Kendricks in this defense? A huge matchup for me. Number four, I'm going to go with Charles Harris, talented Lions defensive end versus Christian Darisaw, their young left tackle. Um, you look at Darisaw through the first two weeks, he's been really, really good for them. Four hurries, no sacks. A lot like we talked about with Taylor Decker, um, you know, really nothing going his way in terms of, of pass rushers lined up across him. It's been the same way with, with Darisaw through two weeks, um, and, and, you know, I do Charles Harris on this one and, and not Aiden Hutchinson because there's an interesting stat that, that came out this week. Aiden Hutchinson and Nick Bosa have been the two defensive ends in the NFL double team the most. And I would expect that to continue, especially when Hutch moves inside and they have the ability to, 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 to kind of double him with a center guard combo. To me, I think Charles Harris is going to get a lot of one-on-one coverage. I think the Minnesota Vikings trust Darisaw. I think, you know, we saw the impact Charles can have uh, on a game last week with you know the 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 strip sack the and, and fumble and it went out of the end zone and and the Lions got a safety and to me that was the huge point in the game right the offense stalls fourth and goal at the three yard line they don't get it defense comes on the field steps in Charles makes the huge play gets the sack gets the safety Detroit kicks the kickoff right and Khalif Raymond returns at 52 yards and then boom you get the touchdown off of that a huge sequence to me started by Charles Harris and that defense and look he led the team in sacks last year was seven and a half he's off to a good start I think some of the focus especially after last week and Aiden Hutchins performance is kind of shifting maybe toward that way and I think Charles Harris is going to have a lot of opportunities for some one-on-one matchups it's a young tackle he's played pretty well um, but he's got certainly a unique challenge this week in Charles Harris can he impact the game like he did last week Final matchup for me, and we, we talked about it in, in the news and notes, but to me, Amon Ross St. Brown first, you know, their nickel cornerback, Shannon Sullivan. Um, obviously, Amon Ross St. Brown is going for his ninth straight game, um, you know, with, with eight plus catches. And um, when we talked to, you know, both of them, like it's, I mentioned in the news and notes, it, it's not forced. It's kind of natural. It's just him getting open. And I expect that to continue. When I look at Sullivan and, and, and I looked at his first two games, he's been targeted 10 times. He's allowed nine catches, 99 yards, no touchdowns, which is obviously good. Um, but he's got certainly a unique matchup this week with, with Amon Ross St. Brown and his ability to not only run the football, um, and, you know, but, but find the open space in the middle, 
can run after the catch, something he's really tried to improve on. So, look, Shannon Sullivan's got his hands full with Amon Ross St. Brown. Can St. Brown keep it up and, and, and you know, get a ninth straight game with eight-plus catches? That would be quite the record. Um, he already owns the record of, of, you know, six straight games with a touchdown and eight catches. Can he now get into the record book here? So those are my five matchups presented by BetMGM. We'll be back with a couple players. Welcome back to the 20 Minute in the Huddle podcast. I am joined by veteran Michael Brockers. What's good, y'all? He's good. been on the pod before, and he was so good, I wanted him back on. Key matchup this week. You know, mm-hmm. obviously you guys are feeling good after the win against the Commanders last mm-hmm. week. Bounce back's performance after, you know, week one. Mm-hmm. Um, just just how big was that win for you guys? One, getting it as early as you did. Obviously mm-hmm. we know it, it came so late last week. But then mm-hmm. just to have that bounce back, have that good feeling, win at home. It's tough to say a week two games is a huge win, but it kind of mm-hmm. seemed that way for you guys, didn't it? It did, it did. I mean, I mean, Personally, for me, I wanted that Eagles game so bad. Like, I literally cried after the game a little bit just because I wanted it so bad. I knew that was a top opponent. I knew if we beat them, like, it was – it was we're going to put the, the world on, you know, on notice. And uh, it didn't happen. But, you know, we, had, we were able to come back the next week, and that's a good thing about the NFL, man. You get to show each and every, you know, week, you know, why you get to come back and show the world who you are. So – um, that was our whole mindset, the, the commanders. The commanders <laughs> it takes week. a little bit yeah, of it, it does, it does. <laughs> so, it, yeah, that was our whole mindset that whole week, uh, you know, preparing for Washington. It was just, man, let's make sure we're on our details. Let's not shoot ourselves in the foot. Let's make sure we execute, we're talking, we're communicating. And we just took that into practice. The practice was, was up-tempo all week, and we just put it upon ourselves that, you know, um, if we wanted to win this game, we were going to have to do those things and execute. So uh, that's what we did in practice, and it showed out in the game. You know, one of the things that showed up to me, at least, especially when you talk about your unit, the defensive line, was mm-hmm. the ability to finish. Mm-hmm. You know, I thought you guys rushed Jalen Hurts week one really well, and obviously he's a mm-hmm. dynamic athlete, and mm-hmm. he can do so much, but it, it, you just couldn't quite finish. You were right. a, a grab away, a hand <laughs> away, and just he was just elusive enough. Mm-hmm. And the fact that you get Carson Wentz, not the same kind of athlete, but still a guy who can move a little right. bit. He showed that. But you guys finished. Mm-hmm. Well, it was five, six sacks. I think you guys are second in the league after two weeks in pressures. But but the finishing part was the huge part mm-hmm. last week. Do you, do, you, do you agree? Was, no, was that agree. The, 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 the big takeaway for, for your unit week two? Um, definitely we put it, uh, you know, defensive line-wise. We said if, if we were going to win this game, it was going to be because of us. You know, we were going to stop their run game. They, if they wanted to run the ball, we were going to stop their run game. And then secondly, we were going to get up to the passer. And we executed them you know, all cylinders. You know, we stopped their run game, make them uh, one-dimensional, definitely in the first half, made them one-dimensional. And then, you know, when they came to pass in long, long down the distance, third and long, second and long, uh, we, we, we went after them. You know, we went after the quarterback, and we actually brought them down. So I know that's when it comes to finishing. You know, when, when you have great athletes back there and, and – you know, they see man man coverage, they, they usually get out. So, I mean, we were able to, to get the quarterback down, and that was a good thing. Charles makes a huge play mm-hmm. with, with, with the strip sack and the safety. Mm-hmm. Aiden Hutchinson gets his sacks. You guys do your thing on, on the interior, really stuffing that run game. Mm-hmm. Um, what, is that what you, what you guys talk about when you talk about a team effort up front, a team mm-hmm. game? And how big was that for Hutch to get those three kind of out of the way, let him settle in, and, and, and kind of now he can just get rolling? It's funny you say that because I told him in a game, I said, bro, if you get a sack, we're going to blow the roof off this joint. <laughs> and literally the next play or the next third down, he got a sack and the crowd went crazy. But, I mean, yeah, I mean, that's what, what, what our whole uh, motto was that week was – Put the pressure on the D line. Put the pressure on us because we can we can handle it. You know the way we work, the way we practice, we don't mind that pressure. You know, and we went out and showed you know that we can stop the run. You know, with a with a light box or with you know with three down line or whatever. And you know when they played into our hands on third and long, we 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 won those situations. So. Uh, we were happy about that. I loved how the the stadium synced the Billy G in there, and that place was rolling. Yes. I mean, that's, how, yes. What is it like being down there when that crowd it. is like that, when your defense is playing as well mm-hmm. as you guys played in the first half? I mean, right. you guys dominated right. that game. You took it to them, and that place is roaring, and mm-hmm. you're getting – 
Aiden Hutchinson slapping his leg and Billy Jean's going. I mean, just how fun is it to be down on that field playing in that kind of it's, environment? It's it's crazy because, you know, the first game, the first game everybody shows out. You know, they're showing their support. And, you know, honestly, as a player, you know, the first game I'm like, okay, if we can if we can win this game, it'll be like this all season. Right. But we lost. So, we, so I'm thinking, ah. Uh, you know, the second week, you know, we're at home game. We just lost our first game. Yeah, no, nobody's going to show out. They showed out. 57,000, right? Showed up and showed out. Was very loud. I, I'm glad that, you know, the fans here understand situations third and long. They get loud. They get, they, you know, they get uh, get rocking. So, you know, when you're making sacks and defensively we're making plays, it is crazy to play I in bet. that atmosphere. And then you, you, you've seen it. You know, it was crazy for the offense to play, you yeah. know. Uh, and the uh, the opponent offense, you know, they had like three or four false starts just just from not being able to hear or yeah. delay a game. That's what right. I mean. Excuse me, delay a game just from not being able to hear the snap count. So when our crowd is rocking and and roaring, it, it's crazy in there. Now you go to a different environment. Mm-hmm. Now you go on the road for the first time, and, mm-hmm. and that's a pretty ruckus atmosphere there mm-hmm. with the whole skull thing they get yeah. going on, yeah. and, and and it can get loud there if they get going. How different is it defensively when you're now on the road, Mm -hmm. when you guys can communicate to Mm -hmm. each other? And I know Aaron Glenn and and, and even Dan talked about some of the communication issues maybe on the back end of the defense a little Mm -hmm. bit. Just how much does that clear get cleared up when you guys now go on the road? Obviously, you know, they're smart fans in Minnesota. They're going to be quiet for Kirk Cousins in that offense. Mm -hmm. Now you guys can communicate. Mm -hmm. What's the biggest difference between playing at home defensively and on the road where now you guys can hear each other? Is the communication that much better on the road? Uh, It is, but everybody's locked in. I mean, you're going into enemy territory, so everybody's locked in. You know, it's like, you know, everybody's against you at that point. You know, all you got is, is the guys who are in the same jersey and the same helmet, and you, you you feel that demeanor. It's like, man, there's nobody in this in this stadium that's for us, you know. So it's everybody's against us. So let's lock in. Let's, you know, hone in on what we have to do to come out of here with a victory. And, and that's usually the mindset that you go into, you know, opponent's uh, home stadium and you're like, okay, it's our time to lock in. Let's yeah. roll. Well, you guys are going to have to lock in and get rolling yes, this sir, week it's because Dalvin Cook, obviously, you know, one of the more talented kind of th- dual threat backs, mm-hmm. Justin Jefferson and, and yeah. the start he's had. I think Kirk Cousins is is uh, underrated mm-hmm. for the kind of quarterback he is. I think mm-hmm. he gets the ball out of his hands. You look at him statistically, he's, you know, one of the better passer rating guys every year. Mm-hmm. Just what what's the biggest challenge and, and kind of what's the big – point of emphasis this week going in there and facing that offense uh, making sure we're, we're we're key in on uh, on all our assignments you know they do a good job at hiding uh justin jefferson you know in the slot you know they'll put him in the backfield move him out little things like that we have to be keen to um you know who's in the backfield that you know is is he at home is he in the gun so little things like that you know as a defense you have to be uh keyed into and, it, and it'll tell you you know what they're about to do so uh, the biggest thing for us is making sure, like like we said earlier, communicate um, and execute. I think those are our biggest things that we need to do, and that's we need to do these every week. Yeah. One guy I want to ask you about, mm-hmm. um, John Kaminsky, you mm-hmm. know, a guy who's played really well for you guys the mm-hmm. first two weeks of the season. I think led you guys in pressures, but that's kind of under the radar, mm-hmm. you know. But, you know, setting up guys for sacks, I think Aiden's second sack was, was pretty much all John, and, mm-hmm. and Aiden finished it up. Mm-hmm. Obviously, dealing with the kind of the thumb wrist injury, mm-hmm. probably not going to go this week. How mm-hmm. big of a loss is that? And and who do you expect? Expect maybe who's a name you want to give guys there? One of the young guys, if it's Austin Bryant or Julian, that that maybe needs to step into that spot and, and, and kind of fill that role. Um, I mean, it, it sucks to really lose a guy like that because you know Kamish coming in and we're his Kaminsky, but we all call, call him the Kamish. The Kamish. There it is. But uh, you know. When he got here, you know, he was kind of unknown. Nobody kind of knew him, but everybody wanted him. I know I seen on the waiver while I read the article, everybody wanted him. Yeah, there like such eight, a good, eight teams that eight teams claimed, claimed him. him you yeah. know, uh, so you know, knowing that, and you know, I really waiting to see like what what does he have to offer. And, and this is a guy who's always he's always on his keys. He always knows what to do. Um, and he's coming in and he's gonna he's gonna come forceful you know he's bullying he, he has a great bull rush he can get under your pads stuff like that so when you lose a guy like that um it's it's cliche but it's a next man up mentality yeah. you know you we have a b we have julian uh those guys that you mentioned before who who've been in this this defense before knows what they have to do there's it's just their time to step up so usually you know in this situation it's, it's next man up 
praying for uh, Kaminsky and, you know, in the speedy recovery, but definitely we, we got to go with who we have this week. New offense, new head coach, new offensive coordinator, new mm-hmm. offense. Kevin mm-hmm. O'Connell bringing some stuff from Washington, obviously spent some time with the Rams too. Mm-hmm. You threw on that tape. You're starting to prepare for that offense. What jumped out at you mm-hmm. right away? Um, just the different sets that they give you. It's, it's not one – um, look that they give you where it's like, you know, they have that identity. That's them. You know, they can do so much. You know, you, they can do a lot of stuff out of 11. They can do a lot of stuff out of 12. So, um, and when when you have a team that's good at what they do, it's, it's dangerous. You know, they can get in the backfield, back at home, and 11 personnel run the ball. They can get in that same look and play action boots. So, um, the different – uh, varieties of you know offensive play. They got people swapping, motioning back and forth. So uh, your eyes, they play with your eyes a lot. Mm. You know with their offense. So that's why I said we have to definitely be keen to to know who's swapping, who's where. You know if eighteen is in a slot, is he at one? You know stuff like that. So we have to be keen in. Last one from me. I know you've got meetings. You got a busy day still mm-hmm. going on. We appreciate you fitting no, it, I appreciate fitting you. in. I appreciate you having me on. <laughs> um, Aaron Glenn called this a measuring stick game. Mm-hmm. I know it's early. It's week mm-hmm. three, mm-hmm. right? And you're coming off a win. Mm-hmm. But but to hit the road for the first time, how do you guys as players view it View it too? Is, is, is this a measuring stick type game? You guys won three games last year, mm-hmm. right? Obviously not as many as you guys want, but you played so much better the second half of the year. Mm-hmm. Now you got that win earlier. Mm-hmm. Go on the road. NFC North opponent, mm-hmm. right? That next step is yeah. kind of winning some of these games, right? Mm-hmm. Going on the road and beating a, a, a pretty good team. Mm-hmm. Do you guys as players view this as a measuring stick game as well, or, or do, you, do you not have that mentality? Um, I Not a measuring stick, but we all know this is a, a divisional game. You know, the, you know, as I say, these counters too. Yeah. You know, these divisional games, they're, they're serious, you know. Uh, it's almost like a more upbeat tempo when you're playing a division opponent because these are somebody you – you kind of know you played them last year twice. Now you're playing them this year. You're going to have to play them twice. So you f- kind of feel um, like you know these guys. But like you said earlier, you you know, this is a different coach, different offense, different scheme. So I think that's what's making us kind of like lock in a little bit more where it's like, okay, we have to know what we're doing. This is a new scheme. It's not the same thing we played last yeah. year. This is a whole new new monster. So uh, definitely, like I say, locking into our keys, uh, communicating, and I think we'll be just fine. You guys go on the road and get a win, go to two and one. Can you even imagine what that forward field is going to be like? Man, that Week next four, game. Seattle. Oh, my gosh. I don't even want to think about it because I, you know, I can get forward thinking a little bit. <laughs> so let's – week by week. Week by week. You know, one, Minnesota one game first. at a time, Minnesota first, and then we'll focus on the week, next week. Well, good luck to you. I hope you guys play well, come yeah, away with a victory. It. it should be a good one and fun one to watch. He is yes, Michael sir. Brockers. We'll be back. All right. Welcome back to the 20 in the Huddle podcast. And one of the things I've always wanted to do with this podcast is, is be able to introduce some players maybe fans aren't familiar with, right? Some mm-hmm. of the new guys here, some of the young guys. And so I've got defensive tackle Demetrius Taylor joining me this week. Welcome to the podcast. Thanks yeah. for taking the time. No problem. I know you're kind of fitting me in here before, between meetings and stuff, so I appreciate it. Well, we got to start with your alma mater mm. because you know <laughs> you're you're you know a two star guy out of high school, right? Mm-hmm. And, and recruited by Idaho and some of these others. You, you end up at Appalachian State where you become that's a Sun Belt there, right? Yeah. You become Sunbelt. one of the best defensive linemen in the in in the Sun Belt, and now you look at your team mm-hmm. going into Texas A&M, beating them, and then the the hail mary last week. I mean, how lit is App State right now? I uh, mean, they they riding high right now. Um, but knowing, knowing the coaching staff and stuff, they won't let them get too high, get too low about stuff like that. But those being Texas and them on the road, that's tough. It's not it's not something everybody can do. You know what I'm saying? So I'm um, just you no know, kudos to those guys. I know how hard they work, man. They just uh, hard workers, man, and they got a chip on their shoulder every time they play. Just because we never never got respect, even yeah. though if we beat beat whoever or take whoever to overtime. We never got respect. So those guys playing with a chip on their shoulder. You know, guys that come from, you know, the smaller schools like that, that, that maybe don't get the respect to some of the power fives. Mm-hmm. I mean, yourself included, you guys come in to the league with a little bit of chip on your shoulder, right? I mean, yeah. Because you were always kind of considered that underdog. Yeah. Um, just to uh, – we always have a chip on our shoulder just because of how people view us. You know what I'm saying? Like, just because you come from a smaller school doesn't mean you're playing lesser competition. Football is football regardless where you go. So, just to come in and 
show show these guys or whoever you uh, playing for just to show them like, man, I could play ball wherever on any level. It just, it just means a lot. It means more to us, you know. Yeah. So. And talk about that journey. You know, obviously I mentioned, you know, two-star guy out of high school, but you go to App State, you ball out there. Was the expectation that you would, you know, maybe get drafted? What were your thoughts going in? Obviously went undrafted, signed here, and then all you do, Demetrius, is every time you get an opportunity to make a play, mm -hmm. you make a play. Yeah. And, and you earn a spot on a 53-man roster. I want to take you back, take, you know, fans back to the draft first. Mm -hmm. what, what were those days like? What were your expectations going in? And, and, and when it didn't fall that you, you were picked, how did how how did it end up with the Lions? Um. Like, honestly, this my expectations, you know, I feel like everybody's expectations is to get drafted just because they're hiring themselves. Like, and I'm hiring myself. I mean, I did a lot of good things in college. You got, I got a lot of uh, stats and, you know, stuff like that if you look at that. But um, obviously uh, not getting drafted wasn't the worst thing for me. I knew I was going to get an opportunity somewhere. Um, and uh, this happened to be at the Lions. I had a good conversations with a guy who uh, scouted me. I'm about to say recruit, but scouted me. <laughs> um and like five minutes after they drafted uh, Chase, which I think was their last pick, you know, they uh, called me, he's asking what I'm trying to do. I'm saying, I'm coming, just, you know, let me know what I got to do. So I uh, ended up uh, signing here and I arrived I think, like May, May 12th, you know, just got things rolling. So just like that whole, that, them whole couple of days was like, those three days were just like, you know, stressful because yeah. Um, obviously, you gotta keep your phone clean, uh, clear, and then you got all these people calling you from like different numbers. You don't know who's calling you, so uh, you answer it might be uh, your friend or something. Like, bro, stop calling me. I'm trying to, <laughs> you know, make sure the, the, the group the text has to go out. Everything, no one, everything no one. was on. Everything was on. Do not disturb. Something, you know, my phone calls and stuff. Yeah. But just being able to get an opportunity to play here it's, uh, means a lot. So just, just that being able to have an opportunity. And did that fuel you even more? Because I mean, like we, we like I talked about at the beginning, you were one of the guys I thought in training camp that just every time you got an opportunity, like I, I swear in my notepad every single day, I watch all two and a half hours of every practice. I think every day I wrote sixty two down at least mm. one time for yeah. making a play in the backfield, and just w that drive of not being drafted. I mean, what what was that that really pushed you to 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 have the kind of camp that you did and, and earn a spot on this fifty three men roster? Just me being me. Uh, really just I didn't I didn't come in with a chip on my shoulders and I thinking I should have been drafted or whatnot. I was just grateful uh for the opportunity and um I was just willing to learn, you know what I'm saying? Because mm -hmm. I've moved, they moved me inside. I haven't played I haven't played nose tackle or D tackle since you no know, forever. I've been an in. So just me being able being willing to learn a new position and come in and just work. Um, that that that's what was pushing me. Just trying to learn something new every day. And once I got that down, just on to the next. And then that uh, kind of got me making plays and stuff. Yeah. Like once I started doing the technique and learning what I had to do, then I was just more confident. And my confidence grew from the time I got here to camp. And then when I got into camp, we got in pass. That was just like that's what I wanted because yeah. now I can be physical. You know what I'm saying? So be you, be me. So you know, I know a couple of years ago, obviously there was a kind of lows and highs in mm. your life you know you lost your mother to mm. to um you know heart failure you know I, I know where you're at with there my dad passed away of a uh, heart attack in 2015 so you know I, i've been there obviously a tough time but then was it a couple months later you, you the birth of, of of your twin boys and yeah just take me back to that kind of portion of of of, of your life you're obviously so, there at the end of app state you know it's a huge time and and what an emotional roller coaster there right so Essentially, I was going into my last year, uh, you know, playing for App State, and then uh, COVID hit. So uh, I remember mom dropped, she dropped me up back to the airport in March because, you know, it was spring break. And then, you know, I was thinking it was going back to school. So extended uh, spring break for a week. And then that's when they shut the country down with the COVID and stuff mm -hmm. going on. So that was the last time I seen my mom in person. Uh, fast forward to uh, April 12th, it was Easter Sunday. I remember because I was cooking. You know, I always call my mom. You know, cooking. She gave me tips and stuff. So that's why that's why I learned how to cook from. And um, you no, know, she wasn't answering the phone. And then I didn't think nothing of it. Just you know, she probably missed a call. My brother called me, and then, you know, they freaking out. I was like, Yo, what's going on? And it's like, Mommy waking up, and it just like kind of went from there. Like 20 minutes later, pronounced her dead. Um, 
she uh, had congestive heart failure, mm-hmm. stuff like that. It wasn't like it was something expected. It just kind of happened, like, yeah. at a wild time. Yeah. So I lost her. And then, like, two months later, um, I had my kids, my twin boys, Ace and Air. So that was kind of like a – I wasn't one kind of – it was a rough patch because – I really wasn't able to grieve because I still was trying to finish school and finish my classes that semester. And then obviously I had like to be a father, you know, a brand new father. And, you know, that, that could be stressful to anybody For not sure. knowing what was going on. So, um, kind of just, she was, know, just, she was, it young. sounds like you guys were, were, were pretty close. Yeah, man. Um, that was, that was my best friend. It was my homie. Like talked to her about everything. She helped me, like she helped me learn what I need to learn to be a yeah. man. So that that was just like kind of my best friend. How much was she motivation in your path to, you know, the she last was, season of she was like and getting to where you are today. That my last season, you you know your last season in, no. at App State, you know having the season that you did, and then you know obviously doing what you did, you know to, um, to make the team here. Just how much of, of motivation was she during that whole time? As man, well? she like it's always like she she's on my mind like every day just because like she didn't get me see she didn't get to see me do a lot of things like. Um, she didn't see her grandkids. She didn't see me graduate college, and uh, obviously didn't see me uh become, be at this place now. Um, so it motivates me every day, just to, like just knowing. Like, I feel like she's just watching me. Like she's been watching over me ever since. Like you know, she's passed, and this journey I've continued this journey for her. Like yeah. um, her biggest thing was just me getting a degree. So she didn't really care if I went pro or not. She just wanted me to get a degree. So did you get the degree? Yeah, I got the degree. What'd you get your degree in? Uh, communications. Oh, nice. Yeah. But then you go, obviously, that's a low. I've been there. I know it. Mm-hmm. But then you go to that high of, mm-hmm. of, of your twin boys. So how, yeah. how, how, uh, how's parenthood been going? Your boys are two now. Yeah, they're two They got now. some personality. Yeah. Uh, they big kids. Yeah, they big kids. Are they big kids? Yeah, big kids, man. Um, it's, been, it's been good, man. Uh, obviously, been some challenges with, like, just understanding what a baby needs and stuff like that. And then, obviously, playing football because – you know, football takes a bulk of your time, especially, like, I was in school when I first had them. So, yeah. that and football is taking, like, a bulk of your time. But you got to go back home and be on parent mode and help out with, you know, diaper changes, baths, eating, like, feedings, all that. So, it was challenging. But, like, once you get the hang of it, it's, it's been pretty cool. And then just watching them grow into their own little personalities and stuff like that, it's just been, it's been fun. So, they learn, learn something new every day. Now they're talking in sentences and oh, stuff. Oh, yeah. So, they won't stop talking. They, they won't stop talking. <laughs> well, just wait till they become 15 like mine and go to high school for the first time. That yeah. it, it, it goes quick. I want to jump back to football real quick. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, the first two weeks, it's a deep defensive line group. Mm-hmm. You're still kind of fighting to, to kind of find that place there. Mm-hmm. Is that the next hurdle for you? Is that the kind of the next step you see as just, you know, showing them that, that you're a guy that can that can be in there consistently yeah. and, and can be a playmaker? Yeah, that's that's my next step. Um Obviously, first step was just to make the team. I uh, got that over with, and I was just like proving to these guys that I can play. You can, and you can. I could be a starter in this league. That's, bit. That's my mentality. Um, because I feel like once I get the opportunity, I'm just. I'm not gonna go back to where I'm at now. Um, I'm still being. I'm supportive. I'm happy for everybody that's doing this stuff. But like, when it's my turn, it's my turn, and that's just the way I'm seeing it right now. I'm a playmaker. I know Dan Campbell, Todd Wash, those guys, they treat everybody like they're a starter mm-hmm. in those rooms, and you have to be prepared because it's not a matter of, you know, if an injury is going to happen. Yeah. It, it's when, and mm-hmm. everybody on that 53-man roster is going to step in at some point. Mm-hmm. So as you prepare for Minnesota and this offense, what's jumped out to you about, about you know, how good you know they can be and, and how difficult the task is this week? How good they can be is dep- depending upon the quarterback. You know, mm-hmm. um, if he's no good, if he's on, he's on. If he's... If he's trash, he's trash. That's that's how it is. But um, up front, like, I feel like we're better. Like, by a lot. Um, we just watching some uh, cut ups today, and uh, I feel like we can get out to these guys like really, really good. So they got a good uh, defensive plan for what we're gonna do is like to attack them and stuff like that. So, but they can be a good. You know, they have they have great skill guys like with Elon, Justin Jefferson, um, Cook. You know, he gets going and. You know, it's just gonna be a long day because you thinking about stopping running as you with a play action. Yeah, you got two receivers you could throw to. Plus, they got speed with seventeen and everybody. But it could be a good offense. But like I said, bro, if we get to the quarterback early, um, it's gonna be a long day for him. Is that the number one thing you think is is pressure him? Is it stopping him? What's the number one thing in, in Demetrius Taylor's mind that that Detroit walks out of Minnesota two and one, tied atop 
the, 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 the NFC North if you guys do what defensively? I feel like if we – um. Honestly, I feel like we stopped the run. I feel like they're going to try to put more emphasis on the run this week. If we stop the run and make them one-dimensional, we walk out with a win. Because, like I said, if you we're going to get to the quarterback. We got guys that get to the quarterback. So, uh, I don't think that will be like an issue. But stopping the run and then making them one-dimensional, yeah. it'll be fine. Well, thanks for joining me, Demetrius. I, I really appreciate it. I know fans are going to love your story. We mm -hmm. can't wait for you to get out there because, like we said in training camp, every time you got an opportunity, mm -hmm. you made a play. And so we're looking forward to it. Thanks for joining me so much. No we'll problem, man. Good stuff there from Michael Brockers and Demetrius Taylor and Mark Craig of the Minneapolis Star Tribune. Sunday will be fun. P.J. Clark and me will be in Minneapolis, and we'll break it all down post-game, and hopefully we're talking about a Detroit Lions win and a 2-1 first-place Detroit Lions come Sunday night.